Councillors and gallery, uh, can I please have your attention? I welcome you all here this evening to this meeting of the Cardinia Shire Council and declare the meeting open. Please note that this meeting has been webcast live over the internet on the Council's website. It's great to see and I welcome on behalf of my fellow councillors the gallery here this evening. But just a special note that the, we've got the um, Venturers here tonight. Uh, we've got six venturers uh, tonight here uh, from Beaconsfield. It's really great to see you in the gallery here this evening, and um, I'm sure you're going to behave yourself. If you don't, I'll find someone that will sort that out. Um, and also, I, I've got to mention that we, um, we've got a group, uh, six, six uh, people here from the um, Zuchi um, Australia, who is here with us this evening, who's been assisting with our um, uh, bushfire recoveries uh, recently and they've got a question in the in the question time later on tonight I do request that you be respectful while you are here within with us tonight I will not tolerate any interruptions or interjections during our council meeting with respect to our councillors councillors will be available after the meeting if any members of the gallery wish to discuss any of the issues that we have of interest tonight we will commence the meeting with the following prayer. Almighty God, we humbly request that you bestow your blessings upon this council, direct and prosper our deliberations to the advancement of the glory and the betterment of the people of Cardinia Shire. Amen. The Cardinia Shire Council respectfully acknowledges that we are on the traditional land of the Bunurong Wurundjeri people with respect to their elders past, present and future. I'd just like to bring up a few items of this evening to start our meeting before we go any further. I'd like to talk about the bushfires recently that has devastated our shire. So before formally commencing tonight's proceedings, I wish to take a few minutes to reflect on the recent bushfires that has ravaged over 16,000 hectares of our beautiful shire and on the tragic situation that unfolded in Christchurch, New Zealand last week. Our thoughts are with all our community members affected by the Bunyip State bush bushfires, particularly those who have lost their homes and animals of course or have had their properties damaged and their businesses can't operate. Council's efforts are currently focused on ensuring our residents are receiving the support and services they desperately need to recover. Throughout the event over the past weeks, I have been incredibly proud, and very proud, emotionally proud, and impressed by the selfless efforts of the CFA and other emergency services for their tireless and brave efforts in placing themselves in dangerous situations to save lives and property must be commended. And I'm extremely proud to be part of this strong, supportive community, such a resilient community we have. I must also express my appreciation to the countless council staff, which I've witnessed personally, that have provided their assistance over this period. The speed in which they were mobilised to provide the relief services community support to clear roads, improve access, and more importantly, to assist residents who have suffered building loss and damage is a credit to them all and us all. I want to thank the staff, particularly here. It's not just a job here, it's, it's more than a job. They took it to that next level and I'm so proud to be involved. Our work will continue in earnest for as long as it takes for our community to recover. For anyone wishing to assist, the best kind of support you can provide is to donate to the Casey Cardinia Foundation Relief Fund, which has been established to assist those residents and the community affected by the fires to recover as quickly and painlessly as possible. I've asked my fellow councillors if they would like to comment tonight, and Councillor Brett Owen has expressed his desire to speak. Councillor Owen, would you speak, please? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, councillors. Um, I just want to um, 
just follow up exactly what you said, uh, Mayor. All councillors around this table will uh, will definitely repeat your your words. Um, but I just want to acknowledge your amazing leadership uh, through this trying time. Uh, it's obviously been in your ward, your community, and you were personally affected. So, on behalf of councillors, I just want to uh, thank you. Um, you uh, provided that amazing, um, heartfelt leadership um, and your front and centre. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge that. Of course, as you said, our staff have done an amazing job and I saw uh, part of the community response in my, my uh, working life. Um, I saw it in full swing and I was absolutely proud the way uh, our council was responding to this, but also the way our community has responded to this. It, the sheer generosity that people have showed and continue to show um, is simply amazing. And it just reassures that we live in such a great shire. And I also too want to thank all the volunteers, the emergency services, um, amazing. So I just want to acknowledge your leadership through this uh, Mayor and, and thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Councillor Rowan. I, I really uh, thank you for your kind words of support and, and thanks. Um, it was um, an honour and a, just a proud moment to be there uh, as Mayor. And I must mention um, our CEO, who's only been in the position for three months, um, led straight from the front. I want to thank you, Carol, um, from the community, um, for us as councillors to, to be there to, to make it happen, to make these things happen. It just doesn't, they just don't turn this on and turn this off. It was a surprise to everybody. So um, it's got a long way to go yet. This is only... We're in the recovery um, state at the moment, um, so we're still working on it. We, we, we're going to be not going away. We're going to uh, address the recovery um, to the full hilt. So with our volunteers, as you rightly said, Councillor Rowan, um, all the volunteers, and I want to thank the, everybody that's put, in, put their hand up to say, we'll volunteer, we'll, we'll get behind this. Even the uh, surrounding councils have got behind. The mayors have been there, and it's been fantastic to have Borbor and Bass and Casey particularly um, supporting us as a council as well. So it's it's a really um, great effort to see our our community working well together, and it's um, and with your help, councillors, um, it's it's been a great effort. So um, thank you, one and all, and and I want to express that we are doing everything humanly possible to make this transition and get business back to normal. And I'm not sure whether we can ever do that again, but let's get it back to something that we can relate to and. Uh, so I want to thank everybody for, for their involvement. I'd also like to express the Council's uh, sincere condolences to the residents of church, uh, Christchurch who have suffered through the horrendous massacre last Friday. Just seems to be Fridays that just seem to be pretty bad these days. The atrocities is the assault on religious freedom, tolerance, compassion, and Cardinia Shire's arbors such horrendous activities to our friends across the ditch. Our thoughts and prayers are with them all. I trust that this brutality will, will serve to steal our resolve, that such deplorable acts will not defeat compassion and tolerance. As a mark of the respect to those that have lost family and friends, and I must say, we have uh, three or four um, of our um, employees here who were very upset today. They have actually um, their own family involved in, in, in this. And so, therefore, it was very upsetting for me today to even speak to the, um, the, the, the um, employees today who work here. So it was very upsetting. So um, as a mark of respect to those who have lost family and friends, I ask that we observe a minute's silence to reflect this tragedy and the enduring human and community spirit that gives us hope in such a time of grief. So would you please assist me to just have a minute's silence, please, and stand, please.
Thank you very much. No, I now be seated. <clears throat> and thank you. Apologies, we have. Uh, Mr. Evans, have we received any apologies for tonight's meeting? Thank you. It's wonderful to see all the councillors in attendance uh, tonight. Uh, we've been away for a while. We've been uh, had a few weeks of doing other things at the moment, so I want to thank the councillors for being here tonight and being involved. Minutes of a previous meeting. Uh, can I have a motion, please, to adopt the minutes of the meetings as listed? Can I have a mover, please? Councillor Ray Brown. Can I have a seconder? Councillor Carol, Ro Carol Ryan. All those in favour, signify in the usual manner. For? Against. Declaration of interest. Are there any declaration of interest? Councillors. The council conducts its meetings according to the consent agenda. Councillors have advised of the matters for consideration this evening that they have wished to discuss or debate. The remaining items will be adopted without discussion. The items withdrawn for discussion this evening are item two, petition requesting traffic lights at Tumuk Valley Road and Princess Highway intersection, withdrawn by Councillor Michael Schilling. Councillor Schilling. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'd like to move the recommendation that Council notes that the petition requesting traffic lights at Tumuk Valley Road and Princess Highway intersection has been referred to Vic Roads as the responsible authority to be investigated. Thank you, Councillor Schilling. Can I have a seconder, please? Councillor Jody Owen. Back to you, Councillor Schilling. Thanks. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Owen, for seconding um, this very important petition, which was brought to um, us as a, as a council uh, at our last general council meeting, which was actually on the 18th of February. Um, uh, it was um, put together by Beacon Hill student um, Romana, who put a great deal of hard work into this petition in getting 658 signatures for the installation of a signalised intersection between Tumak Valley Road and Princess Highway. Um, once again, and, and I mentioned this at the last council meeting, I, I'd like to thank Romana for her advocacy uh, and showing the initiative of, um, of um, getting this done. I agree the intersection during peak school times is dangerous and quite often it can be seen as a disaster waiting to happen. As a responsible road authority for the Princess Highway, Vic Roads needs to assess this request. Um, the petition was sent through to Vic Roads in December 2018. So Council did receive the petition um, prior to this date, but we didn't have a general council meeting where it could be tabled prior to that. So it was sent in December, requesting for Vic Roads to investigate and provide a response to both um, the petitioners and also to council. Council has had discussions in the past about this intersection, um, in specifically around future signalisation and also the crash trend, which has been gradually increasing over time for this intersection along um, the traffic along with traffic volumes which have increased as the school size has increased and we've had um, large intensification of the growth corridor as well. Council does support the call for a signalisation at this intersection as it is known um, that there are excessive traffic delays during peak hour periods and there has been a significant crash history at this particular site. Uh, unfortunately, at the time that this report was prepared and put into the council agenda, unless anything um, has happened in the past um, day or so, um, no correspondence has been received from Vic Roads despite numerous attempts to contact them by email or phone for an update prior to this meeting. We all recognise how critical that signal um, is for that intersection and whilst it's um, not in our jurisdiction to be able to, um, to install this um, signalisation, I urge council and the community to continue lobbying Vic Roads until the community gets what they need and what they deserve. I'm happy to keep updating the community on the progress of this intersection as more um, information comes to light. So I'm just asking tonight for councillors to support the report which has come back from this petition and that we continue advocating for this vital piece of infrastructure in our central ward community. Thank you. Well said, Councillor Schilling. Uh Councillor Jody Owen, would you like to speak as a seconder? Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just want to keep it really brief. I um, concur with what Councillor Schilling has said. <laughs> it's all right, relax, it's fine. Mr Paxton's on and it's all good. Um, 
students now through education do civics and citizenship and in that what they're trying to teach children of all year levels is that they are they are themselves a global citizen and by being a global citizen when they see a problem or an issue they have as much right as adults do to take some action so I'd really like to commend the students of Beacon Hills and I'd absolutely support any other children, students of any ages out there that if you have a grumble or a groan, yes, bring it to us because we're not just here for big people. As we've shown in the past with Big Budget Brainstorm and other uh, ventures, we also do like to hear from our youth because you are part of the population and we're living in a world that one day will be yours. That's all I've got to say. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jody Owen. Any other speakers? Any other councillors want to say anything? Councillor Carol Ryan. Thank you, Mayor, through you. Um, I'd like to, to support um, the signals being put um, on this intersection. I myself have travelled through where the school is and the traffic is quite enormous. Um, the only concern I do have is that we do have quite a few different, uh, quite a few uh, lights on the Princess Highway um, and would it um, interfere too much with the traffic flow? That's the only concern I have. Other than that, I am in support of, of signals being put at that intersection. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Ryan. Any other speakers? No other speakers. Uh, back to you, Councillor Schilling, uh, for a sum up. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor, and, and thank you to the other councillors, Councillor Owen and Councillor Ryan, for, for speaking speaking on this. Look, I, I know that this report is is not what school students at Beacon Hills and all of the support networks would have been hoping for. Um, as um, yeah, bureaucracy is frustrating at the best of times for local residents, and it's also incredibly frustrating for councillors as well, particularly when we just want our residents to um, get, as I said before, get the infrastructure that they need, and residents just want a solution, and, and so do we. And, and it's not until you start digging down into the bureaucracy and, um, and escalation chains that you, that you see that um, not everything is a clear and, and easy fix, and, and this is um, no exception to that rule. So whilst we can't fix this intersection right now, we can do what council does really well, and that's to continue advo advocating um, to Vic Roads and also advocating to different levels of government as well for funding um, to, get, to, get this, um, to get this problem resolved. So um, personally, um, I'll, I'll continue to do that and, until we do see a result um, in the community. Once again, I'd like to thank Romana, who um, was very successful in getting this petition um, all together and everyone that has supported her. Um, and I guess if you, if you look through history, progress is um, rarely gained in our community or anywhere in the world by sheer luck or a bit of potluck. It always takes campaigning and perseverance from people to get progress. So um, it's, never, it's never lost and I, I just continue people just to keep, keep going until we do see this um, signal <clears throat> installed and I look forward to the day that um, it is there and perhaps those students can um, come back and be the official openers of the, of the crossing and we, can, and we can do something to celebrate. So um, just asking for councillor support to acknowledge the petition and acknowledge our ongoing advocacy for this project. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Schilling. Well spoken, and uh, and I um, endorse your words. Um, okay, councillors, um, uh, all those in favour? For? Against? Carried. Thank you. Item four <coughs> is the Genbrook Leisure Park Master Plan, withdrawn by Councillor Springfield. Councillor Springfield. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I would like to move that Council endorse the Jembrook Leisure Park Master Plan. Thank you, Councillor. Can I have a seconder, please? Councillor Wilmot. Councillor Springfield, back to you. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm very proud to bring the, um, the finalised Jembrook Leisure Park Master Plan to this Council meeting tonight and, um, and to see it along its journey for improving this space within the township of uh, Jembrook. Um, it has a nice uh, little journey for myself with this. This is one of the earlier things that came to, into this council term. When I first became a councillor, um, we were made aware of um, 
the, the dangerous, somewhat dangerous state, but the broken down state of the Jembrook playgrounds and, and skate park. And um, upon further investigation by council officers, it was recognised that it was in dire need of, um, of refurbishment and upgrade. Uh, it was a uh, led by community initiative back in 2000, I think it was completed. Um, timber design, the skate park obviously was not made of timber. Uh, and has seen its end of life come, you know, come to um, come to this time. Um, so we started this journey of uh, of how to refurbish and revitalise this. Uh, along the way, I'll jump a few steps, but along the way, we've managed to secure state and federal funding to the tune of uh, five hundred thousand dollars each. Included our own contribution of five hundred thousand dollars, which gives us uh, one point five million towards uh, upgrading this. Uh, Jembrook Leisure Park, which is going to really make it a feature within the Hills Townships. That there's not another Hills Township that has something to this scale um, and to this design. Um, so it's really looking forward to seeing this uh, get off the ground. It's been um, extensive community consultation process um, throughout this time. There's been two drafts that have gone back towards community consultation for feedback, um, which has helped us to arrive at our, um, at our final draft, uh, which I present tonight to us all, and which I believe is online for people if they wish to look at the, um, our website and, uh, and get a good uh, gurney at it themselves. Um, I'll, I'll mention some of the things included in here. Uh, we, we've got a half court. Uh, basketball court set up. We've got a, a, a large skate park center within there. Um, you know, uh, extensive uh, green areas and treat areas that we're refurbishing. Um, a large playground, which is all going to be covered in soft rubber matting for to keep it nice and soft for big kids and small kids alike that may fall off the monkey bars. A new car park along uh, Binak East Road. Uh, toilets refurbished, the barbecues um, are going to be refer a whole new barbecue site and it's yeah really going to be a, a great centerpiece for uh, the town of Jembrook um, and is you know is probably long overdue uh, due to the state of, of what the what the current park is looking at at the moment. Um, I would like to at this point this uh, thank uh, the state for the Growing Suburbs Fund of 500000 which I mentioned, and thank the federal government for the Building Better Regions Fund, which they also um, gave us a grant of $500,000 towards this. Uh, so it's universally recognised across the three tiers of government that this is, you know, this is well due for the community of Jembrook and, and surrounds. People will travel to this. It's not, it's not just a local, a local uh, playground type of thing. It is, um, it is the next level something that we can be proud of, delivering for our communities uh, within the hills and within this region. Um, thank you, man. That's a, enough for my brief introduction. I'll, I'll give it back to you. Thank you, Councillor Springfield. Uh, second to speak, uh, Councillor Wilmot. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and I just want to agree with a lot of what Councillor Springfield has already said. This was a community project that was done back in 2000, where the community banded together and, and built this park. And uh, it's been a very popular park for all of that time. And it still is. I was out there just a couple of months ago during the school holidays and I was amazed by how many people are still using it when it's in, in a really poor condition at the moment. So to rebuild this park will be a fantastic thing for the region, not just the township, because people will come. Um, now that we have the, the uh, Eastern Dandenong Ranges Trail going from Emerald through to Cockatoo and then on to Jembrook, it makes it easy for the young people to transition from one town to the other. Um, I know over the years they've had problems getting um, BMX bikes and so forth on the public transport. Bus drivers aren't real keen on those things coming on their buses, so that's always been a bit of an issue. But the kids will be able to use that uh, multi-use trail to uh, to go out to Jembrook and to have a skate or a ride on their bikes or whatever they choose to do. Um, I just want to say thank you to the staff as well for the effort and the work they've put into doing the community consultation. They've really gone above uh, where we used to do consultation. They've been to the Jembrook market on several occasions and set up marquees there. Um, they've engaged with four different local primary schools about what the kids would like to see in their park. 
They've been to the Emerald Secondary College and they've held um, lunchtime workshops with the children there to get an idea of what they'd like in the skate park. They've held on-site workshops um, in regards to the skate park and actually brought a specialist skate park designer out to talk about what the possibilities are and what um, potential there is in that site. It's quite a large site and um, we were able to, uh, from the original concept plans, make some changes to make sure that the escape element of the park stays as large as what it currently is. Um, also just wanted to note that um, the playground area has actually just finished its own separate consultation period uh, where the public's had an opportunity to vote on one of five designs. Um, that consultation's closed but we haven't seen which one's the winning design so that's a, a little bit of excitement and good news still to come for the community but I'm, I'm pretty confident that the community will enjoy this park and I'm sure that the, the broader community and the other townships will also make the most of this fantastic facility um, and thanks also goes to the state and federal governments for coming on board with this project and for recognising the importance of it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wilmot. Uh, any other speakers on this subject? Councillor Brett Owen. Thank you. Uh, my ward councillors, fellow councillors have covered it really well and I don't have much uh, to add, but um, just want to follow up with what Councillor Jody Owen said in the uh, earlier item about uh, young people being involved in such a process. And this was a classic example where young people, you know, really fed into the design of this, um, you know, this, this reserve. Um, as said uh, by uh, previous councillors that, you know, we went to schools, uh, we had that one-on-one -on -one focus group in relation to the skate park, in relation to the design. The draft, it's fair to say, underestimated the, the popularity of the skate park and the need for, you know, a big skate park. So through their engagement, through their feedback, um, council changed the draft and, you know, really highlighted that the skate park was a, a really important place for, for young people. So I think uh, that was fantastic. The report does outline some changes from the draft to uh, what we're adopting tonight. And I'm sure some people may be disappointed in some of those things. For instance, the removal of the proposed zero depth water play area due to uh, lower community priority. When we went to the community, that was a lower priority and also the construction funding constraints and also the ongoing maintenance costs and issues. So I know some people may be disappointed with that. Um, we note that, um, but I encourage them to have a look at the report and just see why council is, is making uh, this decision. What I'm really pleased about is through this process, uh, council has engaged um, a crime prevention through environmental design um, sort of checklist. I've been banging on about this sort of thing for, for a while that council needs to really uh, focus on crime prevention when you are building these places, these public places, particularly from the scratch, you want to uh, make it, you know, do it right. Do it safe, you know, you know as, as, as possible in the first instance. Too often do I see that, you know, an issue occurs and then council retrospectively have to, you know, improve or, or make changes. So. So through this whole process, we saw a crime prevention through environmental design checklist and completed and, and that fed into the design. I think that is best practice and I'm really pleased that we're seeing these sorts of, uh, you know, checklists form part of our, our designs and master plan process. So I just want to thank all the uh, community members that were involved in this consultation. As Councillor Wilmot did say, we're currently uh, undergoing the playground design and there was a number of different options and I know that these are quite popular in relation to you know, the community engagement, getting their thoughts and, and council obviously will, will consider that and build a fantastic playground uh, with, uh, with that feedback. So I also want to commend the, the staff, they've done a great, uh, great job in this space and I look forward to the development of this reserve. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Owen. Any other speakers on this subject? Councillor Ross. I, I echo my fellow councillors who have uh, shared the journey for this leisure park um, and highlighted so many of the attributes for it for the local community. I'd like to just highlight a couple of other things. Um, the fact that the, the federal government's put in half a million dollars, the state government put in half a million dollars, 
uh, into a $1.5 million project. That's a million dollars that ratepayers don't need to find for this project. And that makes it a whole lot better project than what would have we could have afforded to build. I must say it, it is excellent when the state government and the federal government both buy into the vision of these play parks. And I must say our council staff with Kevin Alexander have done an amazing job. If anyone's down, been down to the BP Ronald Reserve and seen the park that was renovated down there, we call it the truck park in behind the library. But um, that's won state awards for the number one park built in that year under a certain price range. So I look forward to seeing the, um, the amazing park that will be built up there. I've seen uh, the growth of the, the leisure park designs through council on the journey. I must say too, um, uh, one of the reasons we got the money off the state government with the Growing Suburbs Fund, and people, sometimes it can be uh, seen as a negative, the amount of population growth that we do have in our shire. The Growing Suburbs Fund only comes to those councils which basically have um, a sit around the ring of Melbourne. 50% um, of all Victoria's population growth comes to the interface councils. And in Cardinia Shire, we've had uh, in lately seven families a day moving in. We've had five to six families a day moving in for the last 10 years. And because of this maximum growth, the whole Shire can benefit through the Growing Suburbs Fund, not just inside the urban growth boundary. And this is a wonderful example of how our towns can benefit as well, where the Growing Suburbs Fund just doesn't come to the interface. It comes to the whole Shire. And I must say, uh, for anyone who, who goes up into the hills and enjoys the absolutely wonderful surrounding outside the urban growth boundary, that's what makes Cardinia Shire the place it is, an amazing place. You can drive up into the hills, you can go to Jimbrook, Cockatoo, Emerald, Upper Beaconsfield, you can go down into Coorup and Lang Lang and all through the, the, the towns, the, the railway towns. And I must say, the more we can put into those towns and beautify them and upgrade them, the better our shire will be. And this is a wonderful example of where visitors, locals and people of all abilities can take their kids. And they might even drive up into the hills if they go to this park because they'll see what a wonderful park it is. I know how much Kevin has put into it and I must say I can't wait to see the finishing result and it will be outstanding. I'm sad to hear and I must say it does look like it's had a whole, whole, lot, of, whole lot of wear and tear over 19 years up there. Um, because it is really in a state where you wouldn't really want to take too many people down there. But I must say the revamp will be wonderful, $1.5 million. Considering ratepayers don't have to find the whole 1.5 is a wonderful result. So I'd just like to commend all those people who put the money in, all the councillors in the area too have participated with the community in putting this together. So we'll wait to see the finishing result and I'm sure it'll be a state winner as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ross. Any other speakers on this subject? I'll go back to the mover, uh, Councillor Springfield. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you to my fellow councillors uh, for sharing their thoughts with us. Um, just, to, just to finish off, this process, uh, community consultation process, ha has been a wonderful um, ex experiment, and but not experiment, but it has been a wonderful experience. It's, um, you know, we went out with the initial draft idea, with a whole bunch of ideas that, that were possible, and then we and then we got feedback from the community in various ways of what they liked most. We came back with two drafts of that um, to arrive at this final concept. And as uh, Councillor Owen pointed out, one of, the, one, of the one of the resounding things that was necessary for this park was the, the retainment of the skate park, of, of, of making sure it was a, um, a suitable facility for the skaters and the bike riders and the scooter riders of the region. And I, I commend um, council officers for taking that on board and recognising that as one of the highest priorities um, and delivering that uh, through this plan, through this master plan. Um, with that, we found along the process that, um, that in the uh, in initial drafts, so, and I think perhaps the second draft revision we had, um, the costing was about $800,000 over budget of what we had to manage. So we had to prioritise to what was most important. So. Again, I applaud the officers for recognising the importance of the young people of the area, even though old people can skate too, Graham, if you'd like to give it a try one time. Um, 
but I, 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 w- I wouldn't dare challenge you, man. I'm, I'm, I would be sure to lose. Um, but I, I, I applaud the council officers for, for, for recognising that. And, um, and as was pointed out, we, um, we were looking at doing this uh, water park, play park. I'm glad I've got some smiles around the room. That's what I... <laughs> as long as you're smiling, Graham. Um, <clears throat> but that is something that we can, you know, that we'll look at in the future in other areas because it was, it was not identified as the highest priority. So, um, so thank you to the whole team for putting this together and I look forward to, uh, you know, to shortly down the track when we can all enjoy the playground together. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council Springfield. Yes, we shall, I'm sure. I'll be happy to be there. Um, so we've heard the, we heard the debate. Um, we'll signify the usual manner. All those for it? Against? Carried. Well done. I'll discuss it with you after uh, Councillor Springfield. Um, we're up to item six, um, which is the Worrell Reserve Pavilion, withdrawn by Councillor Brett Owen. Councillor Brett Owen. Thank you, Mayor. I move the following, that Council accept the tender sum of $2,632,450, excluding GST, from Lloyd Construction Group, for contract number 18 slash 44, Worrell Reserve Pavilion, and the common seal of council be affixed to the contract doc documents. Move so. Thank you, Councillor. Can I have a seconder, please? Councillor Jeff Springfield. Back to you, Councillor Brett Owen. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Springfield. So uh, this project involves the construction of change rooms, standard and universally accessible amenities umpire rooms, first aid, kitchen and social space, meeting rooms, communications, community and gymnasium facility, cleaner store and storage spaces on all encompassing building footprint of around 500 metres square. So that details the project, but this is really great news and you know, council is committed to uh, upgrading uh, our facilities that don't make uh, you know, the, the, the needs and the demands of, of today. It's fair to say the uh, old change room uh, facilities on Worrell Reserve is not up to scratch. Females can really not really play there because I've heard stories of females having to changing their vehicles. Not acceptable. We know that there is a large female participation now in sport, particularly around football and we know that this ground is the home of the Emerald Junior Football Club and uh, this is really great. They've waited a long time for this, you know, it's been earmarked for a long time and now it's Emerald's uh, turn uh, for this uh, Pervian upgrade. So uh, the report details how it was a competitive tender, uh, it's a very competitive price and we're, and we're uh, proposing to appoint Lloyd Constructions Group. So uh, we all know that the ground is in the uh, you know, growing stage of the grass that we've just resurfaced uh, the, uh, the oval there. Um, so I understand that construction, once this tender is accepted, will, will occur very soon, probably next month. So that will be great. No delays in that. So I look forward to this uh, being a reality well overdue. Uh, and this is obviously going to particularly you know, cater for our young people, also, uh, of course, cricket and, and so forth like that, and other users of the, uh, the reserve. So I support this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Brett Owen. Uh, second to speak, Councillor Springfield. Uh, thank you, ma'am, and thank you, Councillor Owen. Uh, this is a wonderful thing for the Emerald community and for the Emerald Junior Football Club. Uh, it has been a long time since um, they've had some uh, serious refurbishment on this facility. I, I myself remember going to um, the parties and such back in my high school days at Emerald at, at this junior football club. And I don't think it's really seen much upgrading uh, since then, back, uh, back in the 90s. Um, so it's... Uh, overdue and is going to be very welcome. Uh, it's a great thing for the Royal Reserve as a whole that we're getting all these projects done at once, right, to minimise the disruption to Emerald uh, 
right now there's a lot of disruption to Emerald. There was um actually there was some car parking on the main street getting ripped up today as well, <laughs> holding us all up. But this the, the short term pain of of the you know, delays that they're experienced with um the Hills Hub, uh, and this being built and the the pavilion. Uh, it's going to be a fantastic year next year once uh, once everything is up and running. And uh, and I'm very proud to be part of a council that has helped uh, deliver this um, for Emerald and for the Hills community as well as the wider Gardenia um, Shire residents. So thank you to my fellow councillors and, and thank you to the officers for, um, for putting in the hard work to make this happen also. Thank you, Councillor Springfield. Any other speakers on this subject? Uh, Councillor Wilmot. Thank you, Mayor. Um, again, I agree with my ward colleagues, uh, Councillor Owen and Councillor Springfield. This project is one that's long overdue. Um, the facilities there are, are very outdated. And same as Councillor uh, Springfield, I've attended many meetings and parties, etc., in those rooms over the years, and there hasn't been any change in those rooms for a very long time. So it's well and truly overdue. The public toilet facility is one that you would avoid at all costs. So it'll be nice to have an updated facility for the general public when they're watching the games as well. Um, and the gymnasium downstairs uh, is, is, has always been well used, but uh, it's a very dark, dank little spot. So it'll be wonderful once it's opened up and refurbished as well. And um, I'm sure that there'll probably be an increase in membership once it is done. So timing-wise, this is perfect. The oval at the moment can't be used until next uh, next year because of the uh, resurfacing and the reshaping of the oval. So to uh, do the pavilion during that time so that both of them will be fully operational by the time they can get back onto the ground is an ideal timing, ideal. It will cause some congestion, I'm sure, with the um, coinciding with the Hills Hub uh, construction, but at the rate that that's changing at the moment, it will be over uh, in just a few months' time. So it won't be too long now, and it'll start to ease up in that area. But I think this project's um, really good, well, um, well overdue, and the fact that we've been able to um, have Lloyd Construction come on uh, for this build is fantastic. They're a very good company. They're currently doing the Triple C um, extension, and they've proven to be a very uh, good good organisation to work with and very professional in their approach, so I'm sure they'll do a great job for us. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wilmot. Any other speakers? Councillor Ross. I'd only like to add one more thing to the fellow councillors who have highlighted so much about this good pav um, redevelopment of the pavilion. I think um, it, it's testament to our council that years ago we decided that we would turn our facilities into female-friendly facilities, starting off with uh, the netball courts um, around our shire, building actually proper pavilions for them so that the, the females who do play sport don't feel like um, second-hand, second-rate citizens in our shire. And I noticed through this, fa uh, sporting female-friendly change rooms female friendly of a female friendly standard i think that's really really important we started doing this years ago and i think it's so important at the moment because afl women's football has really taken off i still play over 35s football and i must say in the over 35s football there are that many women who want to come and play over 35s football as well it's really impressive um, I just think it, it, it's wonderful. I think it's great that we can finally turn our sporting facilities into all gender facilities, not just based for males and then females sort of fit in somewhere. We can actually set them up so that they can feel part of it all and it is totally considerate for them. So I can't wait to f see this facility be built. Uh, it's got so many other features that were pointed out by my fellow councillors, but so that's something I think is a real highlight. And we actually started the trend on this way before um, it was done by most councils. So congratulations. Thank you, Councillor Ross. Any other speakers on this subject? Before I go back to uh, Councillor Springfield to um, sum up, um, I'd just like to commend everybody. No, it's not. Sorry. It's... No, it is. Councillor... Oh, no, it's Brett Owen. Sorry. Councillor Owen. Um, I'd just like to say that um, what a fantastic facility this is going to be, and I know it's um, it's it's over, overdue, as you said, which is right. And I, going on what uh, Councillor Ross said before, I've got two daughters that are over 35 that played uh, for Bunyip 
and um, so it does happen. It still will happen, and I'm looking forward to uh, another few years of that if we if we get around to that. But um, I'll go back to the um, the uh, mover. Sorry, Councillor Brett, uh, that was you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillors. I just want to reiterate: this is a community facility. Yeah, obviously, there's users, there's clubs, but it's a community facility, and these facilities are used by the community, whether they're for parties. Um, there's a community gym. There's a community gym um, as part of this development. So uh, that's a long standing community gym that we've uh, catered for in this new design. But these are not just for the clubs, they are for the wider community. And we've got to remember that when we build these facilities, they are for the wider community and, and greater uh, community benefit. I just want to, uh, on Friday, I, I just wanted to make sure that all the clubs were okay with all the plans and, and on Friday I had long conversations with staff and I was reassured that the clubs, are they've signed off on the plans and they're really comfortable, they're really happy with the design. Um, of course the Committee of Management of Warra Reserve has also signed off on the plans and, and that's really good, really good to hear that they're happy with it um, and they've signed off on the plan. So I look forward to the build and it's going to be a great community asset. So thank you Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Brett Owen. Okay, you've heard these stories here tonight. Um, who all those in favour? Four? Against? Carried. Thank you. Item seven, the appointment of the independent members to the audit committee as withdrawn by Councillor Brett Owen. Councillor Owen. Thank you, Mayor. I move that uh, Messiahs, Vince Philpot and Michael Sayed be appointed as independent members of the audit committee and two, Mr. Hugh Parks, whose term as a member has expired, be removed as a member of the committee. I move so, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Can I have a seconder, please? Councillor Colin Ross. Councillor Rowan. Thank you, uh, Mayor. Uh, we thank Mr. Hugh Parks, who has been a member of the audit committee uh, since 2015. He served a, a four-year term, so we thank Hugh for his uh, contribution uh, in his very important role as an independent member. So Council recently went through an expression of interest. Uh, we received a very impressive, uh, Councillor Brown and I sat on through this whole process, a very impressive um, expression of list, uh, sorry, expressions, uh, and we had 12 on the list, and it was a very difficult job. Um, to, to um, you know, uh, go down to a final two. But we have uh, recommended that we accept Vince Philpot and Michael Sayed. Um, they have extensive um, audit experience, both in local government, uh, non-government organisations and business, very extensive. Uh, so we, uh, we welcome their future contribution uh, to the audit committee. The audit committee is a very important internal you know, uh, uh, committee of council to ensure that we're doing you know, the right thing in relation to best practice and finance, etc. It's a, it's a really uh, important job. Um, council is moving in line with the recommendations of the proposed Local Government Act um, that will uh, determine, once it's adopted by government, that um, the audit committee must have majority independent members. Currently, the, before this resolution tonight, the audit committee comprised of two councillors and two independent members, so there was not a majority of independents. So we're moving ahead of any sort of local government changes there, that we will have three uh, independent members and two councillors. So that is a, a positive change uh, that's in advance of any proposed changes. So we are uh, now uh, proposing to appoint two members instead of the initial one when we went out. Um, so I think that's a, a, a positive step. So I re recommend the, those two people in the report to be part of the audit committee. Thank you. Well done. Uh, thank you, Councillor Brett Owen. To the seconder, uh, Councillor Colin Ross. Nothing further, thank you. Any other speakers would like to say a word or two, like Councillor Ray Brown? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I support Councillor Owen's views regarding the appointment of these two people. As he said, we had a, a very impressive list of um, applicants for this job and it took a lot of sorting out. And we did, um, we did take a lot of time over it. And based from my observations at the last audit committee meeting, 
whilst these people were only observers, I was very impressed with the input that they gave to the meeting and I'm confident that we have got the two right people. So thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Brown, for your input. Any other speakers, please? Before I go back to the mover, Councillor Brett Owen, I'd just like to say, um, I'd like to thank uh, Councillor Wilmot for her uh, last two years of being on the Audit Committee. It's a big job. Um, and I want to thank you from the community and from us councillors for your input, valued input, into that Audit Committee over, over the last two years. And also uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Ray Brown, for stepping up to the position. These are big jobs uh, we have within our shire and um, I want to thank you for your valued, uh, valued work. I'll go back to you, Councillor Brett Owen. Thanks. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, that was a miss of me for not mentioning Councillor Letitia Wilmot and, and Ray, uh, Councillor Brown. So thank you, Mayor, for doing that. Um, but uh, I appreciate uh, Councillor Wilmot's efforts the last two years and I welcome Mr. Councillor Brown uh, to the Audit Committee. Um, and as the report says, I think it says it well that we re recommend these two people. Well qualified, I believe. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ryan. Well, well spoken. Um, will you signify in the usual manner? All those for this? Against? Carried. Item 8. The shade policy withdrawn by Councillor Schilling. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'd just like to um, move the officer's recommendation that we endorse the shade policy. Thank you, Councillor Schilling. Can I have a seconder, please? Councillor Jody Owen. Councillor Schilling. Thank you, Mayor. Look, this might sound um, like a little bit of a, a strange item to withdraw a, a shade policy, but um, the reason why I've done it is because it's an important piece of public health policy that the council has done um, as a way to keep our um, keep our population healthy. And as a local local government, I, I think we serve. Uh, we have quite an important position in keeping our residents healthy. We don't fund hospital beds. We don't wait till somebody has a heart attack or needs surgery. Our, our job in preventative health care is to have good public policy that keeps residents healthy. And this is just one of those policies that um, would have slipped by. Not many people would know um, that um, we also work quite a lot in this space. Um, this policy is integral around protecting our residents, particularly around the harmful effects of, of UV and, and sun. Um, we promote active lifestyles in the Shire. We've just passed two huge um, infrastructure projects um, now. Um, and yeah, we build pavilions, passive recreation spaces. We're speaking, talking about the Gembrook Park. Um, we build kindergartens you know, so we can, um, we can give kids good educations. But within our facilities, we also have a big responsibility to keep our residents safe. Um, we talk a lot about risk and we've just spoken about the audit, the audit committee as well. And I guess that's a different type of risk. But with our public, every day we're trying to mitigate risk on a daily basis. However, we probably don't always think of something as, as simple as the sun, something that affects us um, every day. Um, some of the latest research from the Cancer Council shows that approximately two in three Australians will be diagnosed with some variety of skin cancer by the time that they are 70. Um, and look, and that word does sound quite alarming, and I admit not all skin cancers are as catastrophic as things like your melanomas, but um, they do account for a significant part of um, morbidity amongst Australians. So I'd like to, um, I'd hate to think that council in some ways has been negligent to our residents using public facilities and trying to provide adequate shade for our facilities, um, for our community. So um, we want to ensure that there is adequate shade structures, but this policy uh, really does um, implement the importance of having natural shade within our community through the use of trees and cleverly designed um, paths and parks which encompass um, trees that are already there or trees that will grow um, quick enough to provide um, some of that shade. So a few bits of this policy which we will use when designing all of our public um, spaces um, and it will include, as I just mentioned, the use of natural shade um, as a cost-effective solution. It doesn't have to cost thousands of dollars to um, provide this type of um, shade. Uh, we talked about before, some, a councillor mentioned, I think it was Councillor Wilmot mentioned, the, um, the Hills Trail, um, people using that. Um, quite deliberately, a policy like this fits in there quite well, where we're looking at inst um, planting trees along that. So as people are riding, cycling, walking, whatever um, mode of transport they use on the path, um, 
that there is shade um, available to them. Within our policy, we also want to make sure that we have up to 90% UV protection um, for our residents um, as well using, using our facilities. We also are looking um, at skate parks, um, BMX tracks around um, providing adequate shade, not only for people that use the facilities, but also um, to um, supporters and people who are, who are coming down to enjoy, come and enjoy the activities. Um, I'd like to thank council staff for working on this. It's not an overly big policy, but it's a very important policy, which um, will go to um, making sure our community do stay healthy uh, for a long period of time and um, prevent any uh, potential morbidities that um, could occur from um, continued sun exposure in the community. So I'm just asking council to endorse this policy tonight and um, recognise its importance um, as we move forward and build new um, public spaces for people to enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Schilling. Councillor Jody Allen, the second, to speak. Nothing further to add, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Any other speakers on this subject? Councillor Carol Ryan. Thank you, through you, Mayor. Um, thank you, Councillor Schilling and Councillor Owen for uh, giving your input. Um, this is very close to my heart about um, skin cancer. Um, and you're right, um, two out of three um, people at the age of 70 are diagnosed with skin cancer. A lot of that probably back in those days when, you know, I'm not that old yet, but uh, uh, we didn't use sun cream. We were out in the sun all the time or we went down the beach and we just automatically went in the water or we're outside doing um, activities and there was nothing, no, there wasn't any knowledge at that stage about uh, skin cancer. Um, but I do have a person that's very close to me for 38 years has been um, dealing with skin cancer. So um, hats off to her that um, she's still doing the fighting. But um, to me with the UV levels, um, it's more damaging now than it's ever been. Um, our knowledge again, um, and it's been um, up on the news continually about what um, um, Cancer Cancel Victoria is doing. I think they do a tremendous job and if we can uh, prevent some of our, our children growing or adults um, with um, the shade policy, then I endorse um, this policy. I think it's a fantastic idea. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ryan. Uh, Councillor Ross. Thank you, Councillor Schilling, for withdrawing this item. It is a really important item. You, you sort of said it's people might be um, wonder why you withdrew it, but it, it really does have a lot of significance and in relation to people's lives. Um, I must say I, I can remember times when I was really young when people would go out in the sun to get a suntan. And in fact, they wouldn't put sunscreen on, they put, they'd put oil on to try and burn faster so that they could get their tan faster. Um, as we know, moving on down the years, Australia has the number one um, amount of skin cancer per population of any country in the world. And that's not going to get any better as time goes on because we're all subjected to so much sunlight and we do so much outdoor activity in Australia. I know personally from my grandfather who used to have skin cancer cut out of his nose every six months. Um, and that was because he was a carpenter, so he was out in the open and he thought he was probably bulletproof too and he could walk out. And as we've found out over the years, the first 15 years of, of young people's life is where they do the most damage as far as their skin goes, uh, destroying the cells, the skin cells. Um, we can always remember the um, Slip Swap Slap campaign that came in the, the 70s when people started to realise how bad skin cancer was. And I think it's absolutely imperative that council um, gets involved in this. I know schools have made a great attempt to try and put shade cloth across playgrounds and walkways and those sort of things. Uh, I know schools even have policies now where you have to wear hats at a certain time of the year and you're not allowed outside. 
I think with council, it is really important that with a policy, people might say, well, it's just common sense. But the important thing about a policy is every time we have some council-owned land where we build infrastructure or we have council-controlled land, we run the policy pass to see whether we are doing the best we can to make sure that these areas are shaded. So I think it is really important. Thank you, Councillor Schilling, for bringing this, bringing this up. And I'm sure that generations ahead, the better we can do this, uh, with the shade policy, the b b more grateful they'll become in the long run that we've actually done something to try and help them. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ross. Any other speakers on this subject? Thank you, Councillor. So I'll go back to uh, Councillor Schilling. This is a, a shade policy, not a shady policy, by the way. Councillor Schilling. Thank you, Meredith. I don't know if I missed something there, but I'll, I'll go back and look at the video afterwards. <laughs> and, um, yeah. um, so thank you, everyone, for, for your comments on that. It is an important policy, and um, look, I really do appreciate um, everyone's input. Um, latest data that we have to hand over a two-year period, there are 102 residents in the Kidinia Shire that were um, diagnosed with melanoma, and, and we know that um, sunburn can occur within less of than 15 minutes of sun exposure on a clear January day. Um, so look, the data is there, we know that it's dangerous, we know that skin cancer is impacting on our very community, um, we know that we're trying to encourage people to get out there and use our reserves and, and, and be as fit and healthy as possible, so this just adds that extra level of protection and um, good public um, policy to put out there in the realm to um, yeah, mitigate any further risks and um, make sure we have a, a happy, healthy population um, into the future, so I'm um, just looking for Council to support this tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Schilling. Uh, all those in favour? Four? Against? Carried. Thank you. Councillors and gallery, uh, that concludes discussion on the items withdrawn. Uh, can I have a motion, please, to adopt the recommendations of the balance of the items listed? Can I have a mover? Councillor Jody Owen. Can I have a seconder, please? Councillor Carol Ryan. All in favour? Four? Carried. Reports for minutes of the committees. I note that Several reports from varying committees have been tabled in addition to the minutes of, of recent council briefing sessions. And these are available if any councillor wishes to view them. Council reports. Councillors, any matters to report? Councillor Jody Owen. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I've got a little bit of good news and it may seem a little unusual that I'm mentioning it, but just bear with me. So, on the 17th of March, um, Chris Buckingham, who is the CEO of the Kayser Cadinia Library Corporation, went up to Brisbane with um, some Casey staff as Bunjil Library was nominated for an a ALIA Library Design Award. Um, Casey Cadinia won that. So, although it's a Casey Library per se, what is, what is really important and special about this is there was over a 1,000 um, AILA members who voted on the design. And the interesting thing is it was not just the physical design and the architecture of the library. It was also the staffing and the experience that members had when they went through the library. So I find that extremely exciting. I think we've got a, we've got a really good CEO in Chris Buckingham um, at the top of the organisation. I'm chairperson myself and I, I really think that in the, hopefully, fingers crossed, in the not too distant future, we will have an awesome library here at um, Officer and we can learn even further on this excellent example of Bunjil Place. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Jody Owen. Any other reports from councillors? Councillor Michael Schilling. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just a, a few quick things um, I would like to like to mention. Um, Councillor Brett Owen and I both sit on the Access and Inclusion um, Committee, which we, we know is it's a community-based committee also uh, with council officers, which advise on um, uh, disability access and inclusion issues across the Shire. Um, each year we have a, a small budget um, of $150,000 to provide small-scale upgrades. Um, and there was one quite significant one in Central Ward which has been completed um, in the last in the last few weeks, which since my time on council, people have highlighted as being a big issue, and that's around our community garden 
at living and learning um, in Pakenham. Um, it was actually near impossible for somebody with a wheelchair or with a walker or any sort of mobility aid to get over the gravel path to get to the community garden. Um, and at the Pakenham show on the weekend, I, um, I noticed that um, there's now concrete there. And we were only discussing that a few weeks ago um, at the meeting that, that it was on the agenda um, to, um, to be done. So look, um, in terms of um, report, that's all I wanted to mention today because it's um, sometimes it's those small um, things that matter the most to the community and um, it can be tough sometimes as councillors and I'm sure everyone will agree here is you can get a community concern saying look just a small query um, but that small query um, and bit of work actually takes years of hard work to get up and um, look it's been almost well it's been over two years now since being on council um, and that's been something that I know has always been raised as an issue so um, yeah congratulations to that committee and all the hard work that they do and I look forward to seeing the rest of their um, of the small scale upgrades happening around the community in the coming months. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Schilling. Any other reports from councillors? Councillor Colin Ross. Uh, a few weeks ago at the last council meeting, actually, um, Councillor uh, myself and um, our CEO Carol Jeffs went up to Canberra for the National Growth Area Al Areas Alliance um, catch up with the politicians before the next federal election. Uh, it was really well attended. I flew up on Sunday night. We caught up with the uh, executive of the National Growth Area Alliance in relation to the needs of Cardinia Shire and growth areas. And on the next afternoon, we met with um, politicians from all sides of politics um, and senior ministers and shadow ministers in relation to the needs. Um, for those who, who don't realise, uh, the interface councils right across Australia are the ones on the, growth, uh, the edge of the urban growth boundaries. Uh, you've, got, um, you've got some on the Gold Coast, you've got many in Sydney, many in Melbourne, uh, you've got some in Western Australia as well. And the, the growth area in these areas, because they're going often into greenfields areas, they have no infrastructure in those areas and the populations are really booming in those areas. So as we know, councils provide tens of thousands to, say, low millions of dollars into these areas. Uh, state governments provide, you know, hundreds of millions, up to, say, billions of dollars. Federal government provides billions of dollars into these areas. And people don't realise with a budget like ours in Cardinia Shire, we, we get, say, about $100 million a year. If a federal, say, the state government, with their growing suburbs fund, have given into this area in the last three injections of fund. We've probably got about $13 million to $14 million out of that to build infrastructure. Uh, what we've done is we've put to the federal government that it's about time that they stepped up to the plate in this area, uh, particularly in Victoria. Victoria alone has half of the population increase in Australia. And the, and the interface councils around the ring of that actually represent almost 50% of the population boom in Victoria. So you've got 25% of all Australia's population boom coming to the shires like ours. So it's about time that we, and we went up there and it was called Catch Up, uh, the Catch Up Campaign. And it's about time that we got more money. Uh, the state government have started to realise that we need money and now the federal government are starting to realise we need money. And now that we have results that have, have clearly shown the amount of benefit that you, the communities get back from the money that they give is enormous. Uh, I also attended the other week, which um, our CEO and our Mayor did as well, and some of our council staff, the Interface Council Week in at the state government. And we meet with all the parties in the state government and we talk with them about the needs of interface councils and the, where we lack and what we lack in services and infrastructure. I must say it was a good reception again. Um, we'll wait to see what they hand out. It usually comes out at budget time what they tell us. I must say on a federal level we can't wait to find out what the promises are coming up to an election that um, you know what sides are going to respect these urban growth boundary uh, councils around the outside and we um, I must say every dollar that we get extra and the better we advocate is another dollar that residents don't have to find and that's what's really really important the more we can get so therefore I'm really passionate in this area and I know Carol is as well and we go there and we make sure that we we have a foot at the table like the night before we met with the executive we were the only ones who turned up at the meeting so we had a 
uh, one-on-one talk with them about what we felt Cardinia Shire needs. So it was front and centre at the conversation the next day and on the presentation. So, And we were used as a, a model of and as an example of what we need, particularly things like services like public transport and those sort of things and roads being you know, the ones who are probably lack the most of any interface council in Australia in this area. So anyway, uh, that was, uh, we wait to see what the result is. We've had some results in the past with the Growing Suburbs Fund and as it was pointed out with the Jimbrook Leisure Park, you don't necessarily have to be right in the growth corridor to benefit. The whole shire should benefit from um, what we, we need to provide in Cardinia Shire. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Ross. Any other um, reports from councillors? Councillor Ray Brown. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I attended the the uh, Kui Rup Long Lorry Flood Protection Group during the month, and the main discussion was the the um, the fact that Melbourne Water are growing a lot of tree plantations in the drains and the farmers and the pe interested people want to know what they're going to do about it. Melbourne Water, they acknowledge that the growth is in the drains. They also acknowledge that they haven't got a budget to do anything about it. There's been pressure put on to get extra funding so that they can clean these drains out because winter approaching, these drains are going to be critical for the swamp. They're now investing in drones that they can take up inspections of the uh, of the drains instead of people driving around the uh, the drain areas and doing the inspection they're doing that by drones uh, blackberries and noxious weeds and also the uh, um, pests animal pests are also a major issue burrowing away into the drain banks so Melbourne water's got a big task on their hands but I can assure you that uh, they're into it and also the members of that committee are also taking them to task somewhat we also attended the the, um, the biosphere, the Western Port Biosphere meeting at uh, Bunjil Place. Greg Hunt has been appointed as uh, the uh, new CEO there or, or executive officer there and it's not the Greg Hunt you think because he's not getting a career after the election or not setting himself up. Um, Greg's well experienced in the biosphere and all that type of stuff and uh, what we had to do was we had to nominate a, a, another councillor as a nominee on the on the board. That nominee was Quinn McCormick from Frankston and unfortunately I didn't get it on the agenda tonight that we could vote on that so that she can formally take her role on that board. That is because uh, David Gill becoming mayor has got the time to do it, which you'd know Mr Mayor. Um, one of Greg Hunt's first jobs will be is to discuss the KPIs on the MOU that is related to the biosphere. There's a lot of councils, and I guess we're one of them, through myself, they are a little bit unhappy with the way they're operating at the moment with respect of doubling up on some projects and not keeping track on who's doing what. So that's going to be one of his first jobs to undertake. I must say that, that Greg has met with everybody. He's met with people here. He's met with myself, and I'm looking forward to working with him. Um, that's about all. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, uh, Councillor Brown. I do acknowledge that he is a, a well-respected man in that field. Um, so, you, great to have him on board. Greg Hunt is a really nice man. Any other councillors uh, with reports? Uh, Councillor Springfield. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I just want to make a very quick mention. Um, yesterday, I travelled out to your neck of the woods. I went and visited the um, Bunyip uh, family picnic event. And it was a wonderful event. And both yourself and Councillor Brown should be so proud of your local communities out there. After just two weeks of um, experiencing this tragic event, um, they're out there. Community resilience, you know, is strong, and uh, and they're raising funds and money for um for the victims of this event that we've just experienced. But but the community spirit that I that I witnessed and saw out there was, was a wonderful thing. Wonderful thing. It was a great day. Um, I, I didn't stay for a long time, but but I certainly wanted to go out there to pay my respects and to uh, and to participate. So it was it was great to spend some time out in Bunyip. Thank you. 
Thank you, Councillor Springfield. I'm, I'm honoured to have you down at Bunyip. It's really great to, to think you're down there. I was there for a couple of hours. I know Councillor uh, Brown was there for, for a while with his lovely wife, Alan. Um, so it was a really great atmosphere, a really good feeling uh, from the community down there. It was um, well, it's such a great, a, a well-run event. For a short amount of time, they had to get it all organised together. So my hat goes off to the, the all the uh, user groups down there, from the soccer club to the football club, all right through to the basketball stadium. It was re really a big buzz down there. So I'm um, thankful that you um, put the time in to go down there, Council. It was really nice to have you on board. Sorry, I missed you down there. Any other councillors report say? Yes, Councillor Brett Owen. Thank you, Mayor. Just briefly, uh, at the December council meeting, I raised an issue in relation to the rail bus replacement service in, in Officer. Um, there was a resolution where council write to uh, the Public Transport Victoria, and I think the Minister as well, I believe, um, in relation to the issue. Because, um, you know, people of that service had to walk approximately 900 metres from the railway station here to the highway and obviously there's no places to, to, to park or anything like that. So thank you uh, through the officers. Um, we have got a response back and already uh, the new bus route will be in place uh, over the coming month when we've got extensive uh, rail bus replacement services operating in our area. So the new stations will be just down Siding Avenue here, underneath the underpass. So great shelter um, for users, so that's fantastic. So that is only a short walk, about 100 metres from the railway station car park. Council has been working with uh, PTV to improve lighting along that stretch, that walkway. Um, so well, I think that's a really good outcome. That issue was you know, raised with us and, and Council has worked with PTV for those changes. So thank you to the staff involved in making that happen. On the 23rd of February, the Mayor and myself and staff attended the Housing the Homeless fundraiser uh, run by uh, SGD Homes. Obviously they've got a housing project that uh, they've been working with Council, but Good on the SJD homes who are having that fundraiser. I'm not too sure how much was raised, but thousands and thousands of dollars was raised for that project. So well done. It was well attended. You know, I reckon 300, 400 people were, were in attendance. So that was really good. Thanks to all those who supported that and businesses. I know there was a number of businesses who, who got on board. Uh, last week, Rangers Ward councillors uh, walked around the, the town of uh, Emerald um, with the Emerald Village Association uh, committee members to uh, they wanted uh, a walk around Emerald to highlight uh, their con concerns mainly around maintenance and and parking issues and so forth like that so thank you to the staff who attended and assisted councillors so we'll work through those issues um, and finally um, over the weekend I attended a, a fantastic fundraiser by the Jembrook preschool kindergarten uh, in Gilwell Park amazing I want to thank Samantha Willis who's the uh, fundraising uh, coordinator there for Jembrook, but it was a great event. It was called So Long Summer, and it was bands and children's activities uh, in Gilwell Park. What a fantastic place Gilwell Park is. So fantastic uh, fundraiser, and I commend the kindergarten for doing that. Uh, they're raising funds for our, for our kids in Jembrook. So thank you all involved. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Council Rowan. I, I've got to say that the bus stop out here for the officer thing, um, it's due to your drive, councillor, that that has been put in place, and um, and we did we, we, we responded to your request, uh, and it's really good for the community because I've witnessed the um, amount of people that were out here and um, on the highway, and it, and it wasn't satisfactory. It wasn't a satisfactory result. So it's it's really good of you to jump on that and um, and drive it as you do things, and I'll. I'll you're a councillor that really gets in and does things, and I want to thank you from, from the community. Thank you, Mayor. Can I just add one more thing in relation to that? It just benefits, I guess so. I guess if that's so. all right, benefits so many students. So many students from the schools just, uh, just down the road here uh, will use that service. And to have them walk a massive stretch to the highway to access that service was unacceptable. So it's a great outcome for our students and schools. Thank you. Fantastic. Any other councillors with uh, any matters to report? Nope, we're done. Okay, um, councillors, do we have any uh, petitions to um, to table? Have we got a petition to table? Any petitions? Councillor Owen. 
Thank you, Mayor. I've got a petition. It's from a resident in Tonington Avenue officer. Um, and I'll just read the, the prayer or the issue. Um, enclosed is a petition facilitated by myself, which includes fellow residents who are in direct effect to the proposed dog park in Toddington Avenue officer. This, uh, these residents who live in the block surrounding and overlooking the park. Out of every home knocked in the block, one resident wanted it out of the whole park. Please use this as an indication of residents that this will directly affect. We look forward to uh, meetings. So I've got a petition of 26 signatures. Um, so I, I table that petition and council will respond uh, in the next meeting. Thank you, Councillor Owen. We, we, we shall do that. Thank you. Okay, community question time. We have received a question from Mr Justin Dowell. Is Mr Dowell in the gallery? I recognise Mr Dowell. Thank you. I refer your question to the Acting General Manager of Assets and Services, Ms Deb Tyson, to read and answer your question. Thank you, Ms Tyson. Thank you, Mr Mayor. The question is, what is Council planning to have done about the dangerous road conditions faced by residents of LL, Armitage and Browns Roads? These dangerous conditions were, were created by Council's poor decisions to allow for so many schools built that run off Browns Road. The gravel roads were simply not designed to cope with the current traffic loads and are only getting worse as the schools grow. On top of this, there are a number of housing estates now being constructed that are going to worsen the situation even further. I thank you for your question, Mr Dow. I acknowledge that due to the timing of development, in particular the schools, some traffic utilise Browns, LL and Armitage roads. Browns Road is within the officer precinct structure plan, which sets out the land usage requirement for the new officer township, as well as highlighting the associated infrastructure required. Council cannot dictate the timing or phasing of works and development in Browns Road, as this will be a private development and will be sealed by developers when development occurs in this location. As declared public roads, Council cannot stop motorists from using these unsealed roads and, and alternative roads, routes to the sealed roads to access schools and O'Neill Road. Traffic surveys have shown, however, that the traffic volumes using these roads is relative minor and within the capacity of these roads at this point of time. Council continue to monitor, monitor these roads. The LL Armitage Rink um, LL and Armitage Road linked to the end of Browns Road is a candidate for the road development program which Council is currently investigating. Council continue to assess development plans as they arise and look for opportunities to manage the road network to best service our community during this time of development. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Ms Tyson. I believe you answered that quite well. Uh, um, you can have that answer in writing if you prefer, Mr Dowell, or is, I will um, instruct... Um, We'll respond to you uh, by mail if you if you want. Okay, thank you, and thank you for your question. We also received a question from Mr. Wayne Cockrell. Is Mr. Cockrell in the gallery? I recognise you. Thank you, and I'll refer your question to the general manager of, of community wellbeing, Ms. Jenny Secluna. Uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Secluna, uh, can you read and respond to Mr. Cockrell's question? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr Cockrell, Cockrell writes, we are a registered, de registered deductible gift recipient under the Charities Act and we have been trying tirelessly to obtain a list of those families affected by the current bushfires in the hope of distributing funds. What is the chance of obtaining such a listing and working in conjunction with Council to distribute these funds? We have an emergency cash card program which we would like to help families who have lost their homes or suffered some damage to their homes. The program provides $800 for partial damage and $1,600 for homes that have been lost. There will also be ongoing financial support depending on the circumstances. Thank you for your question, Mr Cockrell. Um, I understand that you're a volunteer with the Zuchi Foundation. How have I gone with pronouncing that? It's not too bad. I apologise uh, if I don't pronounce it properly. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you for your question. Council has been made aware from many different sources that your organisation has kindly offered financial assistance to those affected by the bushfires and that your organisation is seeking from Council a list of names and addresses of those residents who have been impacted. As has already been communicated to the Zhu Qi Foundation through an email to May Cockerell, Council has worked in partnership with the Casey Cardinia Foundation to set up a fund for affected residents. And it would be most beneficial if your organisation could see fit to direct your donation this way. That being said, I do note that Zhu Qi prefers to deliver cash cards in person in order to offer support with empathy, love and kindness, and therefore feels that it is unable to donate through the Casey Cardinia Foundation. Regretfully, Council is unable to provide you with a list of personal details of affected residents, as Council is sub subject to strict pi privacy provisions set in legislation. Council has sought advice from the Department of Health and Human Services with regards to how issues such as this one have been handled in the past and we are still awaiting the response. Should Council and its interactions with affected residents identify financial hardship, we can poten potentially provide them with information regarding your offer. We anticipate that the best way to do this would be via the information stand at the Recovery Centre located in Bunyip. Residents can then self-select seeking financial assistance from your organisation. I therefore request that you provide the Council with appropriate material that details your offer of assistance and I'll personally see to it that that information is delivered to the Recovery Centre. I wish to thank your organisation for its heartfelt offer to assist the Cardinia community. Councillors, officers and residents have been overwhelmed by the kindness and generosity of the community and it is so wonderful that organisations such as yours come together when a community, when community need is at its greatest. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Cicluna. Thank you very much for the answer. Um, and it's a very sensitive issue that you answer in this matter, and, and I and I hope um, um, Mr. Cockrell will, will understand what this is about. And um, I'm, I'm sure we can get it to you in writing if, if you need, if, if that's what you prefer to have. Um, I'll ask um, Ms. Cicluna to um, to get that back to you in writing. Thank you. Next, um, we, we've received a um, a question from uh, Ms. Gloria O'Connor. Um, I see and recognise Ms. O'Connor in the gallery. <clears throat> I'll refer to your question also to Ms. Cicluna. Uh, Ms. Cicluna, please. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Ms. O'Connor's questions are: What information is available concerning the huge number of families and individuals requiring social welfare and housing assistance in Cardinia Shire? Is state government or council carrying out any focused, serious research into the causes of the evident increasing problem, problems, including family dysfunction and violence, etc., plus lack of work and income? Should this be a responsibility of government? Is it a result of continuing high population growth? And how does Cardinia Shire compare with other municipalities, for instance, the city of Casey or Balboa Shire? So, Ms O'Connor, I'll take the questions one at a time. Um, the first question was around what information is available concerning the huge number of families and individuals requiring social welfare and housing assistance in Cardinia Shire. There is comprehensive social research and data on social disadvantage and social and affordable housing that is available on Council's website. In particular, in 2016, Council undertook extensive data analysis, accessing over 40 databases, including state government sites, and undertook consultation across the community and with partner social and health organisations to identify key priority areas as detailed in Cardinia Shire's livability plan. The social and health data profile, which informed that plan, is on Council's website, in 2017, Council undertook extensive social research on housing, homelessness and financial vulnerability within the Shire and resulted in a 
in a report titled The Nature and Extent of Homelessness, Risk of Homelessness and Financial Vul Vulnerability and identify that there is a lack of safe, secure and affordable housing for disadvantaged families within the Shire. A summary of this report is also available on Council's website. In 2018, Cardinia's first social and affordable housing strategy was developed. In the course of developing this strategy, data analysis revealed a critical shortage of affordable housing for very low and low income households across a number of population cohorts, such as women, women and children, people with a disability, seniors and youth. This strategy is also available on Council's website. In addition, the website hosts uh, a suite of products known as the ID suite of products that comprises Cardinia's community profile, economic profile, forecast data and maps. These products use data collated from the Australian Bureau of Statistics site. Your second question was, is state government or council carrying out any focused serious research into the causes of the evident increasing problems including family dysfunction and violence plus lack of work and income? As has already been discussed with regards to the livability plan, there are many factors that actually contribute to the welfare and housing needs of our Shire. The livability plan outlines the priority areas of focus to support our local residents to be connected, well, active and prosperous. The livability plan focuses on improving mental health and wellbeing, improving social cohesion, improving safety, reducing family violence, reducing financial vulnerability and reducing harm from tobacco, alcohol, drugs and gambling. Many of these factors are contributors to, to the situation that you describe in your questions. Council's livability plan offers that we will achieve these goals of either improving or reducing these factors through looking at education, employment, the availability of health and social services and of housing. The above mentioned data profile, which is the companion document to the livability plan, which is quite an extensive document, also covers the issue of family violence. Cardinia Council has significantly invested in the support and implementation of the Together We Can Family Violence Initiative. And evidence shows that we're making significant progress in decreasing the rates of reported family violence incidents across the Shire. Victoria Police data is used to collate this evidence. Council also accesses all state government websites and data sources to inform its decision making. And this includes data such as unemployment rates, income rates and financial disadvantage. Your next question, Ms O'Connor, is should this be a responsibility of government? Is it a result of continuing high population growth and how does Cardinia Shire compare with other municipalities, for instance, the city of Casey and Borbore Shire? Compiling research and data that is current and reliable is the responsibility of all levels of government. Decisions at a local government level are necessarily reliant on being in touch with the needs and aspirations of the community it serves. Research and data at a local level can be coupled with that available from the state and Commonwealth to build a genuine evidence base for decision making. With regards to comparison to other councils in the area, we know that on raw numbers, Cardinia would seem to have a lower need for housing support than some of the bigger councils. But we also know that as a percentage of population, the issue in Cardinia is significant and that our rate of increase of homelessness is quite alarming at about 20%, which is second only to Wyndham in Victoria. Uh, thank you very much, Jenny Sapluna, for the um, very comp comprehensive answer. Uh, well done. Um, I offered the same to you, um, Ms O'Connor. Uh, you want that answer in writing from Ms Sapluna's answers? Yes, I do. OK. Can I instruct that to um, happen, please? Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
Uh, finally, finally, uh, we have received a series of questions from Rosa Santos uh, regarding several issues in the Pakenham Business District. I see Ms. Santos in the in the gallery. Um, I'll refer to your first question to General Manager of Planning and Development, Andrew Paxton. Mr. Paxton, uh, can you read the question and respond accordingly to Ms. Uh, Santos's question? Um, so, through you, Mr. Mayor, we might do them in the uh, reverse order in that case. The, the question from Ms. Santo, the third question is regarding parking of cars by business owners which limits space for customers and people in the main street. If designated parking space was provided for business people in the an area near to main street, there'd be more places for customers and people coming to the main street. Um, Rosa, thank you very much for your question. Canadian Council has a number of public car parks and on-street parking in and around Pakenham, which Council's traffic team review periodically to ensure that the car parking works in Pakenham, trying to find a balance that meets everyone's expectations. We acknowledge this can be a challenge at times to find that balance. Council undertook a detailed parking strategy in Pakenham in 2017, planning both for now and into the future. One of the short-term actions was to develop a map which shows the parking available, both timed and unrestricted, to improve awareness of parking options for both business and customers in Pakenham. As Council receives and considers planning applications, specific planning requirements exist for the provision of car parking depending upon the use and scale of development proposed. Council are currently trying, seeking a planning scheme control through the Minister which will allow for cash contributions toward car parking improvements and expansion within Pakenham where individual applications are not able to meet their parking requirements on their site. At this stage we haven't heard back from the Minister. So we are trying to deal with parking and the 2017 strategy did do a lot of work on finding that right balance and found there was still a surplus of parking in Pakenham. Thank you. Uh, thank you Mr Paxton. Yes, I was at the um, caravan that we had in Main Street Pakenham with all the um, the residents coming up and um, with contributing to the parking area. So I um, I was there witnessing the the group that was down there. So it was a fantastic um, input from the community there. Um, I'll go to um, um, Ms. Tyson for um, Ms. Santos's uh, final question, which is number one and not number two. So we just got a background the other way. But thank you, Ms. Tyson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Ms Santo, we've got two questions in relation to the Main, uh, Main Street Pakenham. One being the footpaths on Main Street through Pakenham Business Area that were built 40 years ago were never finished. 14? That's okay. <laughs> 14 years ago were never finished, finally and properly. More work is needed now. And your second question. Why is, there, there, why is there no convenient community toilet facilities located in the Main Street Central Business location? So again, I thank you for your feedback. In regards to the footpaths, Main Street Pakenham has had a streetscape renovation completed in, uh, in, by Council in 2008. Since then, there has been a number of new businesses, services and service authorities undertaking works in the main street that has implicated the aesthetics, while council staff also look to maintain the path to meet the road management plan requirements. Council's draft five-year forward capital works program has already identified the opportunity to upgrade the street, streetscape in Main Street Pakenham. Availability for funding and timelines will be assessed as future budgets are prioritised and considered. In regards to your question on toilet facilities, Council is implementing a public toilet strategy which will deliver various outcomes, one being around how do we go about planning and locating public toilets within our municipality. With reference to Main Street Pakenham, in taking the middle of the street as a reference point, there are two existing public amenity services in this area, namely Burke Park, which has an automatic, automated toilet, which is a four metre walking distance, and secondly, Pakenham Library, which is around a six minute walk. At this point of time, there are no plans for a public toilet for Main Street or elsewhere. However, the public toilet strategy will provide the foundation by which future public toilets are planned and located. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Mayor. 
Thank you, Ms Tyson. And we shall um, give your written uh, response to those uh, questions, uh, Rosa, in, in due course. Uh, thank you um, to the staff for um, your co very comprehensive answers um, to the questions this evening. This does conclude um, tonight's proceedings. I would like to thank again the gallery for being here. Sorry, there's something else. No. That's okay. This concludes tonight's proceedings. Um, before I go, I'd like to thank the gallery for being here and being very patient. Um, I would like to thank again the venturers uh, for being here uh, tonight and, and witnessing a, a council meeting. It's really great to see you along. And I want to recognise uh, Jenny James for being here, a former uh, youth councillor um, on this council. And I would also like to uh, recognise um, Zach Bowman, who is one of our youth councillors here this evening at a, at a council meeting. It's really great to see our, our youth here in, in full flight, um, um, getting, gaining knowledge uh, from our council meeting. I hope you found it entertaining if nothing else. Um, and I and also, can, can I also um, mention the um, Zuchi um, Australia uh, for that group that are here and I want to thank them once again for their offer and in our recovery of our, our community out there who are feeling the pain and I know they are. And thank you to the gallery in general, the usual suspects. Um, it's really great to have you on board here and um, being involved in our council meeting. So I declare the meeting closed now. Thank you.